Our childhood can shape us all. While many of us grow up to be loved and nurtured by our parents, not everyone is given the same privilege. William Bonin grew up in an abusive, alcohol-ridden household with a father who was so addicted to gambling that he gambled away Bonin's own childhood home. He was neglected and abused by his parents, his grandfather and older boys in the juvenile facility he was taken to. At the age of eight, he served time in a juvenile prison for stealing license plates. Bonin became the sexual playthings of others, including his own family. Bonin's mother often left Bonin with his grandfather, a known pedophile who often abused Bonin's mother when she was a child, the own woman who left him there. Bonin's childhood abuse went so deep that his parents would use punishments such as submerging in ice water to the point of suffocation and threats at knife point. As a teenager, Bonin began to molest children. After graduating from high school in 1965, he became engaged and also joined the U.S. Air Force. He served in the Vietnam War as an aerial gunner, earning a good conduct medal in the process. During his service, Bonin went as far as to risk his life to save another airman, but also rape two soldiers at gunpoint, though this crime was apparently never reported. He was honorably discharged from the U.S. Air Force in October 1968. Afterwards, Bonin returned to Connecticut to live with his mother, but eventually moved to Southern California. A month later, Bonin began abducting and sexually assaulting youths, claiming five victims. He was arrested a year later, convicted of kidnapping and sexual assault, and sent to a state hospital to be medically treated. He was later moved to a proper prison after it was ruled that he couldn't be treated. However, Bonin was released in May 1974 after doctors concluded he was no longer a danger to others. Sixteen months later, he was arrested again and charged with the rape of 14-year-old hitchhiker David McVicker at gunpoint and the attempted abduction of another teenager, being sentenced to between 1 and 15 years at California's men's facility. He was released on October 11, 1978, and later moved to Downey, where he lived in an apartment complex. Bonin eventually found work as a truck driver and began to date a girl. In Downey, he became acquainted with his neighbor, Everett Frazier, and became an attendee at the parties that Frazier held at his apartment. During one of these parties, he met and became acquainted with a factory worker and part-time magician named Vernon Butts and a Texas native named Gregory Matthews Miley. These two men would end up becoming his accomplices and a key part of his crimes. Young women, particularly prostitutes, are widely known as the serial killer's most likely target. Yet with all the attention to female victims, the public sometimes forgets that more than a third of all those murdered are male. Back in the late 1970s, when the bodies of young men began turning up near Southern California freeways, parents were reminded that their sons could be just as vulnerable as their daughters. You get more bodies and more bodies, and uh, finally, I would say in late 1979, you realize that there was a mass killer out there. All John Doe CBS 2 reporter like Dave Lopez began covering the gruesome murders of the so-called freeway the killer. The, the freeway played such an important part because it was so easy to get away. I mean, you know, you could drive forever in different freeway exchanges. Complicating the investigation, bodies were scattered widely over several counties with inconsistent patterns of evidence. And then you had those who were badly tortured. Then he had those that weren't tortured. Then he had those that were thrown when the car was moving. Then he had those that weren't thrown. In 1979, the killer began targeting boys as young as 12, picking them up hitchhiking, or simply snatching them off the street. Some of them were stabbed. Uh, most of them were strangled. Uh, some of them had signs of being tortured. For Detective Bernie Esposito, each corpse held clues to the killer's evil personality. The thing that stands out in my mind is the pain that he inflicted on, on these young boys and the callous disregard he had for their feelings, uh, for their families, for their lives, for their being. You know, he, he treated them strictly as some type of a sex object which was there 
only for his pleasure and his gratification. Then it continued to evolve to a point where his sexual gratification actually came from the killing of these young boys. The fear that began to grip Southern California affected even seasoned cops like Esposito. I look across the breakfast table at my 14-year-old son and just imagine how I would feel if someone came knocking at my door in the middle of the night telling me that my son had been found brutally murdered and left in some field like a bag of trash. Frustrated by a lack of interagency coordination, a half dozen detectives created their own informal task force. My partner and I joined up with two detectives from LAPD and two detectives from the LA Sheriff's Department and we just kind of uh, became a rather close-knit group, the six of us, and started to put all of the information we had together and work together as a, as a six-man team. The freeway killer continued to forge a bloody trail until detectives got the break they needed in June 1980. 19-year-old David McVicker came forward to say that he suspected the killer might be William Bonin, a local truck driver who had raped McVicker five years earlier. And McVicker tells me how after Bonin had done everything he wanted to do with him, he dumped him out and he says, you know what, you're an all right guy. I was going to kill you, but I want to come back for you and use you again. The detectives discovered that Bonin had been convicted of molesting five other boys back in 1969. Psychiatrists had declared him an untreatable sex offender, but five years later, he'd been released. Soon after, Bonin raped McVicker, for which he spent three more years behind bars. Now, with new information, detectives put Bonin under 24-hour surveillance. It was on an evening that LAPD was, uh, had a surveillance team on Bonin that he picked up a young boy, took him into a parking lot, and uh, began to have sex with the young boy. And they could, the officers could hear sounds coming out of the van that disturbed them. And the police almost waited a little too long. I mean, this kid was in the throes of being strangled in the back of that van. Fibers from Bonin's van tied him to a number of the killings. We didn't really need his cooperation uh, to convict him, but we needed his cooperation to try to determine who he killed versus who someone else killed. Thankfully, after a period of time, a group of police officers ranging from the LAPD all the way to the LA Sheriff's Department got together to create an informal task force. And in June 1980, the victim who had been released by Bonin and set free had gone over and tipped off the police officers regarding Bonin and his activities. On November 5, 1981, his trial started in Los Angeles County where he was charged with 12 of the murders relating to the victims whose bodies were found within the particular jurisdiction. During the trial, Miley testified against Bonin, describing in graphic detail the murders they committed with him. However, his other accomplice hung himself in his jail cell awaiting trial. After the, jury, after the trial ended, a jury deliberated for six days and found Bonin guilty of 10 of the murders acquitting him of the deaths of Thomas Lundgren and Sean King. Lundgren because Bonin explicitly denied involvement. King because Bonin led police to his body and was exonerated by a related plea deal. The combined convictions resulted in a death sentence. He spent a total of 14 years on death row, during which he filed multiple appeals against his conviction, all of which were unsuccessful. Interestingly, Bonin suffered largely with the idea of death, although he was largely responsible for the deaths of many of his victims. During this time, he became acquainted with Randy Kraft, another quote-unquote freeway killer, on death row. In March 1983, Bonin went to trial in Orange County for four other murders and was found guilty later that year on August 26th. He was executed on February 23rd 1996, being the first person to be executed by lethal injection in the history of California after the gas chamber was branded as a cruel and unusual method of execution by the state. Although Bonin was given justice, many find this to be a bittersweet ending for a man who committed so many atrocities and left so many lives in shambles.
Hoping to avoid the death penalty, Bonin led police to a missing body and detailed 21 chilling murders on tape. One of the things that struck me is that he was sitting there telling you in, in graphic detail how he brutalized, uh, sexually abused, and murdered these young boys, like he was talking about yesterday's news. I, I mean, it was just incredible the lack of emotion that he showed while he was describing all these murders. Dave Lopez scored an exclusive when the freeway killer granted him a jailhouse interview. It was like someone threw cold water on my face, listening to a guy sitting there describing to you how he killed people and why he killed people. Uh, oh, the kid looked, he was an easy target. It was a game, that kind of stuff. You know, how he would have sex on, the be on his mother's bed with the, with the kid and then kill him. Bonin claimed that he'd been sexually assaulted himself as a young boy while in juvenile detention. I asked him, I said, what happens if you don't get caught? And I remember he looked at me and said, I'd still be killing. He just, he couldn't stop. He said that about four or five times. I couldn't stop. Police also arrested two accomplices, Vernon Butts and James Monroe. I, I looked at Vernon and I said, can you go through with it? And he said, yeah. So I see that. James Monroe was given 15 years to life in prison. Before he could be brought to trial, Vernon Butts hanged himself in his cell. William Bonin was convicted of 14 murders and sentenced to die by lethal injection. He said he, he'd been in prison enough that he wasn't afraid of prison, but he was terrified of the death penalty. He told me that. He says, I don't want to die. On February 23rd, 1996, after William Bonin's appeals were exhausted, the notorious freeway killer was finally executed. He never told me why he enjoyed killing. He just said he liked the sound of kids dying. Other than that, he could give no other reason. Next.